sweet hour of prayer, sweet hour of prayer that calls me from a world of care and bids me at my Father's throne make all my wants and wishes known in season of distress grief my soul has often found relief and not escape the tempter's snare by thy return sweet hour of prayer sweet hour of prayer sweet hour of prayer thy wings shall my petition bear to him whose truth and faithfulness engage the waiting soul to bless and since he bids me seek his face believe his word and trust his grace i'll cast on him my every care and wait for thee sweet hour of prayer sweet hour of prayer sweet hour of prayer may i thy consolation share till from mount pisgah's lofty height i view my home and take my flight this robe of flesh i'll drop and rise to see the everlasting prize and shout while passing through the air farewell farewell sweet hour of prayer this is the day the lord has made let us rejoice and be glad in it. Glad that you're here this morning, and uh, it's a beautiful day. Let us pray together. Almighty and eternal God, we give you thanks that you have brought us once again through a, another night and into a new day and into a new week. And now as we sing our hymns of praise sent to you, and we hear a word spoken upon which we shall reflect upon your goodness, your love. Help us then by coming this day and being nourished by your presence that we will leave better able to meet the challenges of this day and the coming week. We ask this in the name of Jesus, our Savior, who taught us all to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen.
thank you for waiting. In the past few weeks, the youth have been studying about the fruit of the Spirit. The Apostle Paul wrote in the book of Galatians what the fruits actually are. The youth have created a banner with each attribute named and illustrated with their own interpretation of what that particular attribute means to them. Please listen as these young people share the fruit of the Spirit. Galatians 5, verses 22 through 23. The fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. There is no law against such things. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self control I mean, gentleness, self control. That concludes our program. <laughs> Appreciate the children and the youth to come and to take part in that. And the gifts of the Spirit are good to remember throughout all their lives, for indeed they will have parts of that, those gifts. There are just a, a few uh, announcements. There are some folks that are in bold, of course, in our prayer list. I want to add to, to that uh, George Fowler and Fran, when they come, they usually sit in the back and, and they're ill. Uh, and so uh, keep them in your prayers. I'm going to be gone for a few days this week or maybe the whole week, I don't know. Uh, last night I, I got a call. I thought it was a birthday call and because I recognized the number and it turned out to be the niece of one of my oldest friends. And she shared with me that my friend had died yesterday or, or at least in the last few days they weren't sure as they found her she didn't show up for work a couple of days and and found her uh, body so uh, I'm going to go to Ohio and, and officiate that service for for them um, do keep that family in prayer especially the niece who found her aunt uh, my friend moved back to uh, she just retired at age 70 and she returned to, to Ohio and the niece was feeling very guilty because she says, I, I promised that if she moved back to Ohio, I would be there to look after her. And she just felt like she didn't do her part. But uh, as I reminded her, her aunt did her own thing. <laughs> and, and if she didn't call you, it's because she didn't want you to, to be there. And, and uh, so it's okay. But uh, guilt can be a horrible thing. So do lift that family up in prayer. Um, Well, let us go to the Lord in prayer. Almighty and eternal God, we are grateful for your presence, most especially that by your Holy Spirit we can be comforted in the times of our long longing for others who have departed, our longing for those who have been divided, and a longing for those who we wished we had done more with. Gracious God, though we are most grateful for the love that comes through your, whole, your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. For indeed, it is through him that we learn to love each other, to set aside our own needs from time to time and seek the better for more people. This morning, gracious God, there are those who are on our prayer list who are very ill. There are those who, through circumstances, have been afflicted, and they are in need of your healing. 
There are others on that list who are living in, in a world in which they are not always certain who's around, but they are your children. And we pray that they realize how loved they are by you and by those who are around them. There are those on that list who face uncertainty as they await their treatment, their medical treatment, and to see the fruits of its benefits. And so we ask that you lift them up. This morning we were blessed with your presence through the children and youth of our congregation, for indeed they are bearing your witness this hour of your love, the spirit that you give to us to be your church, your voice in the world in which we live. So we ask that you continue to bless those in our community, bless the work and ministry that we have, bless the work and ministry of our neighboring congregations, for indeed, you could do it just by a word, but you have chosen to use us as your servants to give witness to the love. For indeed, we can be your hands, your feet, the hug that is given, the tears that are shed, and the closeness of your presence to those in need. Help us to be such, we ask in the name of Jesus, our Savior. Amen. Now this morning, I don't usually share my limelight, <laughs> but Bentley and I are doing a duet. Tell him why. You tell him why. Oh, for 9-11. Okay, for 9-11. What this dying world could use is a willing man of God who dares to go against the grain and works without applause. The man who raised the shield of faith, protecting what is pure, whose love is tough and gentle, a man whose word is sure. God doesn't need an orator who knows just what to say. He doesn't need authorities to reason him away. He doesn't need an army to guarantee a win. He just needs a few good men. Men full of compassion laugh and love and cry men who face eternity and gonna pray to die men who fight for freedom and honor once again he just needs a few good men he calls the broken derelict whose life has been renewed. He calls the one who has the strength to stand up for the truth. Enlistment lines are open, and he wants you to come in. He just needs a few good men. Men full of compassion, who laugh and love and cry, men who face eternity and gone afraid to die, men who fight for freedom and honor once again, he just needs a few good men. Men full of compassion, who laugh and love and eternity and unafraid to die, men who fight for freedom 
and on her once again. He just needs a few good men. He just needs a few good men. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be found acceptable in your sight, O Lord, our strength, our rock, and our redeemer. Amen. So if you want to look with me to the Gospel of Mark, the 8th chapter, verses 27 through 38, I'm just sort of going to go through that. Uh, the title is, When Loss is a Win. I don't know about you, but what I have found in 40 years of ministry is a majority vote doesn't mean you've won anything. When I was applying to a church and uh, the uh, chairman of the search committee came, he says, uh, I know it's taken a little longer than usual. We've had a lot of discussion in the sanctuary, and I've been waiting in the fellowship hall to hear how the vote went. And he says, um, the question has come up, how much of a vote do you want? What percentage would you come? I said, I've been sitting here for a half an hour. I'm hoping for at least 99, because <laughs> I could deal with one person against me but I'm not sure I want to come from any more. <laughs> and I got 100%. <laughs> because that one person came to see me and says, I think we'll get along fine. <laughs> you know, sometimes a win is not a win, it's a loss. And sometimes a loss is a win, and that's what the gospel has for us today. Beginning at the 8th verse or the 27th verse of the 8th chapter. Jesus and his disciples went on to the villages around Caesarea Philippi, and on the way he asked them, who do people say that I am? They replied, some say John the Baptist, others say Elijah, and still others, one of the prophets. But what about you, he asked, who do you say I am? And Peter answered, you are the Christ. And Jesus warned them not to tell anyone about him. And what was happening here was, uh, it, it's sort of like if you're selling something. I remember buying a, a car one time, and, and uh, I asked the man, I says, uh, there are a lot of non-Hondas uh, out there in the parking lot. Oh, that's where the salespeople keep their cars. I said, your salespeople don't drive what they're selling? I left. <laughs> <laughs> Almost didn't buy a Honda that year. Because I'm thinking, that's, that's not good salesmanship, you know? It's, it's like the, the, the guy, and, and he still comes around. I don't know who's sending him to my house, but the fuller brush type person comes trying to sell me a vacuum cleaner at least once a year. Uh, so maybe some of you have pointed down the road and think I need uh, that help, but he's not willing to do it once a week. <laughs> but he was willing to put dirt on my floor to show me how well it worked. I said at that moment I had dirt on the floor and I was going to get it up myself. But thank you for offering. You see, he had the materials and he was there ready. And what Jesus is asking his disciples, do you know what I'm about? Do you know what you're being asked to do? Just to check, because some might say, well, you know, you're John the Baptist. Well, that's a wonderful thing. Others, one of the prophets. Well, that's good, too. But that's not what you're selling. That's not what you're giving witness to, because that's been done. It didn't work. But the prophets and John had something in common. They knew, essentially, their win was going to end in their own death. You know, John the Baptist went and said to the king, Lo, you sinner, you need to repent and turn around your life. And what happened to John? At a party one evening, the king promised anything 
this pretty girl wanted who was dancing for him, and John lost his head. The prophets, none of them lived to be old people. <laughs> none of them had a good ending. They were either stoned, they were slaughtered in some way, which is why Jesus cried when he got near Jerusalem towards the end of his own life, knowing that even he would be facing such a problem because they didn't know who he was. But he needed to know, at least from the disciples, do you know who I am? Because you're going to see some pretty bad things, and it's going to shake your faith. And we know that happens in the world around us, doesn't it? Shaking one's faith. The best part of my birthday yesterday was calling around to friends and having friends call me that I hadn't heard from in ages. They all noticed that I was not on Facebook. And I went off Facebook traditionally, once a year anyway, because I didn't want the Facebook happy greetings. That was way too easy. I wanted them to have to either phone me or send me a card. They beat me at the game. They know how to text. <laughs> what they didn't expect is that I would call them back and make them talk to me. <laughs> I didn't make them sing to me because I don't have a lot of friends who do that. <laughs> but that was nice to catch up. They know me. These are my oldest friends. They know who I am and what I stand for. And I know them pretty well. And that's a good thing in the world because there's so much that is uncertain in the world we live in. So we turn to Jesus knowing that he never changes, same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And that's good in our world. Who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ. Christos. My more learned friends would remind me that he's using the Greek and not the Hebrew word, but it's Messiah. You are the Christ. You are the Messiah. So why not tell everybody? Because that's all he was concerned with. <laughs> you don't need to, to share that other information. I just needed myself to know. And those of you who have been in leadership positions, and I look around the room and most of you have served this church in some capacity or another, don't you want to know who's behind you? <laughs> if you're starting a program, you want to know. You want to know who knows what the story is. What is it we're about? You were the Christ. So, Verse 31, he then begins to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. He spoke plainly about this, and Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him. This would be as if Cox or Fox and CNN and uh, PBS and every news station began to attack something you believe. And you're going, what, everybody, everybody, everybody's going to rebuke me? So you can see why it upset Peter. You just asked us, we told you who you are, and we know who you are. What makes you think this other's going to take place? The world's a hard area to cover and to change. It's hard to change. Hard to change what we got used to, hard to change from what we were used to, to something new, although we are doing it here and there. But we don't change fast. Our mindsets slowly might move in one direction. He began to teach them. He began to teach them. He didn't state it. He just said, look, I'm teaching you. Here's the basic 101 of being Christ. This is what it means. We'll discuss it later, but this is what I want you to know. And Peter jumps in there and rebukes. I don't want to learn that lesson. I don't, that's not what I'm expecting. That's not the Christ I just said that you were. That can't be the one. And when Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan. He said, you do not have in mind the things of God but the things of men. 
Now, I, I don't know about you, but that could fit me at numerous times. When, when I want to say something or do something, and, and I'm going, okay, do I have the pastor's hat on? Can I get away with this as just a regular person or is somebody really listening to me? <laughs> yeah, I know, because it's really what I want to say, but I just don't. Because it's a worldly thing, and it's not, it's not said that way. It won't help anything to say it that way. And though I might not get that burden off my shoulder, I probably need to bear that burden just a little while longer. Because if I say what I'm saying, I'm sounding like the world. And it is not the world that's offering me eternal life. So why would I want to sound like the world? You are the Christ. That means something. Even in the world. You are the Christ. Then he called the crowd to him along with his disciples and said, If anyone would come after me, he must deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. For whoever wants to save his life will lose it. But whoever loses his life for me and for the gospel will save it. And then my favorite verse, other than you are the Christ, this little passage what good is it for a man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul? What good is it sometimes? I, I get aggravated when I hear, you know, the 90% 90, 90 of the population wants this. But is it good for us? Or there's a vote in Congress, one by two. And yet it affects millions of people. Is that good? Could they have not done a little better job? Jesus is teaching the disciples, we're going to be one church. It's not a democratic process, but at the same time, you don't want to leave behind people. You want them to understand what it means to be in the world and what it means to be one who knows he is the Christ. What good is it for man to gain the whole world and yet forfeit his soul. If anyone is ashamed of me and my words in this adulterous and sinful generation, the Son of Man will be ashamed of him when he comes in his Father's glory with his holy angels. Now, I, I have done in my life things that I'm ashamed of. I've apologized. I, I, uh, the grace of God is, is such that I'm thinking that on my judgment day, he will just skim right over that part. Because <laughs> I've tried my best, and I try my best not to do things that would make me ashamed, nor do I want to feel ashamed of anybody else, because that whole thing is not what Jesus is about as the Christ. He died in a shameful way so that we wouldn't die in a shameful way. He died much as a lost person would so that we would not die in that way. He died according to what the world said, but he didn't die. <laughs> because in the world of God, the kingdom of God, we won't die. We can't die. God will not give us up. We might not be in the world anymore, but that's okay. God has a plan. When loss is a win, when we can look at the world and not really fear it anymore, when we can speak out against the things that we fear without speaking against the other children of God, because that's a loss. And that's what I see a lot. I was going to go to a meeting, the school board meeting the other night. I had an issue that was on my brain. And then I saw how many people were signed up to speak. <laughs> and I go, oh, no, my, my, my thing is way down here. <laughs> and, and I'm afraid to be in that group. I don't know what might happen there. And that's not the world I live in. In my mind, I, I live in a better world. I might not live in the reality of what's around me, 
but it's a by far better world. That we see evil in the world, but not see evil in the people. When Jesus rebuked Peter, he was not rebuking Peter as the child of God. He was rebuking the evil that had taken part in his thinking. So Peter, remember what you said, because he is the Christ. He is the one who saves. Let us pray. Almighty and eternal God, we thank you for these words of Scripture, for the stories that are shared with us, for the people that we can identify in, with in these stories that will help us get it, us through not only the tough times, but even be witnesses for others in their tough times. And so, gracious God, continue to bless us with the spirits that are in your church of teaching, of of love, of mercy, of grace, of preaching, of whatever spirit that we need, the gifts to be your people and to continue to, plan, to proclaim you are the one who saves. We ask in his name, amen. Join with me now in our affirmation of faith. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth on the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sin, the resurrection of the body, and life everlasting. Amen. And now I'd invite us to begin in the Lord's Supper. If the deacons will move forward. Blessed are you, Lord, of heaven and earth, in mercy for our fallen world. You gave your only Son that all those who believe in him should not perish but have eternal life. We give thanks to you for the salvation you have prepared for us through Jesus Christ. Send now your Holy Spirit into our hearts that we may receive our Lord with a living faith as he comes to us in his holy supper. On the night in which he was betrayed, our Savior took bread, he blessed it, he broke it, he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat, for this is my body which is broken for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And likewise, after supper, he took the cup and he blessed it and he shared it with his disciples and said, drink ye all of this, for this is the cup of my blood, the blood of the new and everlasting covenant, blood shed for you and for all that your sin may be forgiven. Drink this in remembrance of me. Let us unite our voices as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ has died, Christ is risen, Christ will come again. As an ordained representative of Christ, I invite all who are present to receive these elements of bread and juice offered from the table of the Lord.
body of Christ, for the people of Christ. Take and eat. I shed for the people of Christ, take and drink. Join in the prayer of thanksgiving. We give thanks to you, almighty God, that you have refreshed us with this memorial of thy love and have granted us the presence of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. We pray that in your mercy, you would strengthen us in faith toward you and in love toward one another for the sake of Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. And now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God, the fellowship of the Holy Spirit abide with us this day and forevermore. Amen. <laughs> Master, to be crucified with me. Yea, the sturdy dreamers answered, to the death we follow thee. Lord, we are able, our spirits are thine. of a 
place in paradise. Lord, we are able, our spirits are thine. We mold them, make us like the divine. Thy guiding radiance above us shall be.